Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is your 234th podcast video cast for the week ending April 11th, 2024. We got a ton to cover this week. We'll start with family stuff and then get right down to business. Uh, easy week. This is Mimi and Annabelle at the beach in Westport for the solar eclipse with their uh, solar eclipse glasses on. And then you had, uh, I was in the city for the New York Stock Exchange, which we're going to cover that uh, clip in a minute. It never gets old. Uh, when in New York, get out there. This is some different shots from different parts of the floor that I usually don't show you. That's with Kristen Scholler, who interviewed me. Great time. Nice long interview, about 10 minutes. Uh, this is another part of the floor that you usually never get to see. As a matter of fact, this booth, the street right here, is where Fox Business was. Uh, this is where I did my first ever inter television interview in 2019. Uh, and the camera was right there. And I think I stood right at this line right here. So it brings back a lot of great memories. And uh, that's the Cheddar booth right there. You can see Kristen getting ready for the segment and so on. So uh, moving right along. Uh, this is an interesting table. Thanks, Alan, for sending this over. This is equal weight S&P versus the cap weight S&P. And as you can see here, the difference in rolling one-year rate of change in the S&P equal weight minus the cap weight indices is at an extreme that usually bodes well for periods of massive inflection. What does that mean in English? It means that the concentration of stocks uh, driving the gains starts to underperform and all of the remaining 90 some odd percent of the stocks start to outperform. And we saw uh, this after the 73 crash. We saw this in 1989 mid cycle. That's an interesting comparable. We saw this in 1998 and we saw this in 2012. Uh, as well as uh, looks like about 200, 2020. So equal weight starts to outperform the cap weight, and that means more and more participation for a lot of the stocks that we own. Obviously, we have the Alphabets, we have the Googles, but we, you know, we're going to talk about some boring, awesome companies that will make a ton of money for us over time. And uh, want to thank Kristen Scholler. Kayla Hawkins and Rachel Pyre for having me on Cheddar. We're going to go to this segment because it covers a few things. Number one, a market outlook, inflation, Fed, et cetera, which will save us time on the podcast. But number two, I also talk about a new position in the portfolio I think you'll find very interesting. So here we go. Well, for more on what's moving markets, I want to bring in Thomas Hayes. He's a chair and managing member of Great Hill Capital. Joining me on set, uh, Thomas, welcome. Glad to be here. Yeah, we're happy to have you. So it looks like stocks want to move higher. Yeah. What's your take on the market? Mixed message of the markets, Kristen. Um, what we've seen is markets can correct in price or they can correct in time. And in the last five weeks, you've seen the NASDAQ and the semiconductor index, which were very hot, actually have zero gains. So they've been grinding sideways, consolidating gains while the S&P 500 and the Dow were actually up during that same period. I think we're in a, an information vacuum. We've had this 27% rally off the lows in October, and we're kind of waiting for the inflation data that you referenced and the beginning of earnings season. Interesting. Now, what's your expectation for earnings? Okay, that's an easier question than inflation. Uh, earnings, they've set the bar low. So expectations were 5.7% 5, 5 growth at the end of last year. Now it's down to 3.2%. So I think we'll see probably uh, better than expected earnings that, uh, with, with the bar taken down. The key is going to be guidance going prospectively. Yeah, it is interesting that these companies uh, certainly do seem to be very optimistic and, and generally bullish, right? If yeah. their balance sheet is in a good place, despite what has been persistent inflation, and we'll get that read tomorrow, that first read at least for consumer prices. So what do you anticipate for that? Okay, so there's one school of thought that thinks that the aberrational seasonality of January and February will come out of the numbers and the lag in owner's equivalent rent will come out of the numbers. That lag will be gone, in which case we would get a better than expected number, meaning lower than 0.3% on core and regular CPI, uh, headline CPI. 
Uh, in which case, that would be interesting because we've had this counter trend rally both in the U.S. dollar and in yields. As you know, yields have been going out. If that is the case, what we will see is a compression of yields. Bonds should start to rally. Uh, U.S. dollar should start to weaken because it opens the door for the Fed to legitimately be cutting in June. That's also critically important because the Bank of Japan has stepped out of the global liquidity backstop game now that they've started to be more restrictive and they've stopped with their yield curve control. So the West is going to have to pick up the slack for liquidity, ECB, Fed. Uh, so it sounds like that is optimistic for stocks. I think so. I, I think so. It wouldn't be it wouldn't surprise me to see a little three to five percent pullback. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm willing to be wrong on that. We, we've got a two percent equity hedge, both in semiconductors uh, and uh, the S&P, but we're 98 percent long. So really, the opportunity is not chasing the indices that have been up 27 percent off the lows, yeah. but actually under the surface to find unique, discrete opportunities that have lagged a little bit behind. What do you see as some of those opportunities? Yeah, I've got a really interesting one that no one ever talks about called GXO Logistics. This is one of Brad Jacobs' companies yes. that was spun out of XPO Logistics, and they focus on uh, warehousing, distribution, order fulfillment for companies like Red Bull, Nike, LVMH. Uh, they've got about $10 billion of revenue, which is only 2.2% of the total addressable market, which is $450 billion. They generated uh, over $500 million of operating cash flow, $300 million of free cash flow. And get this, Kristen, for every incremental dollar that they invest in acquisitions or in their business, uh, they're getting back 30 cents. So over 30% return, operating return on capital, uh, and I think this is going to be a compounder. It's an acquisitive platform. They're going to roll up a lot of these businesses in a, in a fragmented sector. Uh, and I think you're going to see over the next couple of years, the stock is down 50 percent off its 2021 highs. I think you're going to see a nice recovery over over a period of two or three years. Interesting. OK, so that's definitely a stock pick that's uh, on your radar that you're yeah. bullish on. Any other stocks or even sectors that look attractive? Yeah, I got one other. I mean, this one is about the least amount of research we've ever had to do on a stock pick, and that's Boeing. And as controversial as it's been and as kind of nonstop parade of bad events, they still operate in a duopoly. So if, if you're an airline and you're Southwest and you say, Boeing, I've had enough with all these problems. Yes, they're replacing the CEO. That's good. But I'm going to Airbus. You're going to wait 20 years for your next plane. They delivered 528 planes last year. They've got 5,600 plane backlog. So uh, with, the, with the way the stock is sold off, we think it's an opportunity if you can take a long term view, 12, 24, 36 months beyond this short term headline noise. So how do you, though, make sense of that noise, right? Because it does seem like it's just headline after headline, the most recent one being the Southwest plane impacted taking off from Denver Airport. Yeah, well, the good news is you got a new sheriff in town, so that'll be positive. Uh, and the better news for owners of Boeing is that there's nowhere else to get planes. So demand is, is growing. Supply is lackluster. They're going to they're going to uh, figure it out. And Boeing will be a good beneficiary to your point on sectors as it relates to the inflation numbers. If the Fed gets involved in, in the game, interest rate sensitive sectors are going to start to perform. Small caps need the help of lower rates. Yeah. REITs need the help of lower rates. Utilities need the help of lower rates. So I think there are some opportunities there in groups that haven't performed that if we do get the inflation numbers, they'll start to perform now. If we don't get the inflation numbers, we'll have to wait another few months. I think it has been challenging for investors, especially I would say in the past 10 days or so, right? Uh, PCE data that was pretty much in line, stronger than expected jobs report, comments from the Fed chair, other Fed officials. Uh, including Neil Kashkari. Every day. It's a new thing. Right, it's, it's, right. Uh, it's a circus is really what it is. You know, you, one day you've got uh, the guy coming out with no cuts. Next day you have someone saying three cuts is our base case. Bullard came out uh, recently and said uh, three cuts is the base case. So I think that they don't have as much time as they think they do to be data dependent with the BOJ stepping out as liquidity provider. Because remember, while the West was tightening for the last two years fighting inflation, BOJ was not only buying global bonds, they were buying global equities through ETFs, and that's no longer the case. So unless they're interested in a liquidity shock, they're probably going to have to move a little faster and certainly well before 2%. Three rate cuts? You think that's... We st we're starting to see some of that repriced in the market, more like perhaps two rate cuts this year. Yeah. The earlier they move, the less they'll have to do. That's the name of the game. So if they move in June, they might get away with one or two because they're being proactive. 
If they're reactive, they may have to do a lot more and it'll be a lot more costly. So uh, I'm encouraged that they can move the first one in June, in which case I think two would be in line, something like a 1995 mid-cycle reset. Uh, if they press it too long, maybe either because of the election concerns or other and don't move quickly enough, uh, it could be three or more. And then we face a harder than a no landing. You know, I think some people would say that Powell was behind the curve, right? Yeah. Uh, certainly in September of 2021, calling inflation transitory and then embarking on the most aggressive rate rising several months later that we had seen in decades, right? And yeah. so based on what market participants, you as a professional, have observed of Chair Powell, what do you think actually happens? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, starting with... Uh December 2018, I don't know if you remember autopilot and the market crashed right before Christmas. So uh, I'm skeptical he has historically been behind the curve. He's caught up. So you have to give him credit. He has caught up this time. Uh, he is re recognizing the two-sided risk of not moving at, uh, as well as not re reigniting inflation. Uh, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and, uh, and expect that he will be proactive versus reactive. And a lot of that's going to depend on the near-term data, which, uh, which we're going to get a lot more tomorrow. So where does that put us in the cycle? I heard you mention earlier, uh, perhaps mid-cycle, just for anyone who is thinking more long-term, right? 12, 20, 18, 24 months out there. Yeah, I'm very constructive. I, I mean, short-term, I wouldn't be surprised if we get a little bit of pullback, maybe some, some type of earnings results or something. Uh, but certainly intermediate-term, 12 to 18 months, we're going to be higher. And if you take a look at the secular, I think we're halfway through a secular bull, and that's predicated on millennials being the largest part of the population, age 33. They're going to spend until they're 40, and the market's going to benefit. Okay, uh, very good. Uh, Thomas, anything else we need to know? It's been a while since you've been able to, since yeah. you've been able to make this work on set. Well, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I would just say that uh, any drop that you see, the money is going to be made under the surface. So you don't want to chase the shiny objects that everyone likes to talk about every day. Look for the companies like the GXOs, like the Boeing that are out of favor, but you know are high quality businesses. Uh, for instance, Disney, when it was down in the low 90s, everyone knows Disney's going to be fine, right? And now it's up at, you know, over well over $100 and, and, and climbing. So businesses like that, that are not being chased, that are a little bit out of favor, but durable, high quality for the long term, that's where we want to be focused. All right, Thomas Hayes uh, joining me on set. He's the chair and managing member of Gray Hill Capital. Uh, Thomas, thank you. Thank you for having me. And we're back. Uh, so also want to thank uh, Zahir Kachwala, Harshita, Varghese, Priyanka, Jaspreet Singh, uh, and Purvi Agarwal for including me in their article on Reuters. Uh, and then our quote of the week from Warren Buffett, I don't look to jump over seven foot bars. I'd look around for one foot bars that I can step over. And you're going to see uh, some of the complicated questions we have in our Ask Me Anything question. A lot of people are playing too hard of a game. You know, some, what someone asked, how can I be sure when there's going to be a short squeeze? <laughs> don't worry about it. You can't. Uh, you can be as sure about when you know there's going to be a short squeeze as you can when you're going to hit uh, 31 on the roulette wheel. So um, uh, we'll get to, to that later. This is the indicator of the day, uh, PMO by all. This is one that I look at quite a bit. And it's interesting, as much as the market's moved up, um, it gets hard to be too bearish uh, with this indicator uh, the way it is. Now, I look at that, and now we're going to look at a bunch of indicators that we always look at. And that'll tell a different story. And the story that tells is that the 3 to 8% pullback we've been looking for and hedged for uh, does look like it could be in the card. So let's just take a look at some of these here. Uh, the 10-day put call here, that gets extreme at bottoms. We're, we're not at extremes, but we're also not at such a level of complacency down here where we should see like a monster type of sell-off. And, and that's why I said with Kristen, you know, mixed message of the markets. There's a lot of crosswinds here. Uh, if you look at this uh, NASDAQ 1% EMA advanced decline, it, does it look like it could be rolling over? Yes. Uh, but, you know, in a long-term rally, this can keep refreshing and refreshing and refreshing. So, you know, what I try to do in periods like this is, yes, we have hedges, so we could pick up 
uh, five or 10 extra points of capital to go long into year end if we're right, uh, but not to get too committed and um, rigid about a view that it has to you know, ha ha have a massive correction. And as we look at M2 money supply uh, running some $3 trillion still above trend, uh, it starts to make sense why some of these dips are, are very shallow, which is famous last words right before you get this, the 8% dip. Uh, you know, this is another one, the declining issues tricks. Um, you know, you get these kind of extreme readings more at dips and then you tend to refresh. Uh, this, the Cohen high low, could it be rolling over? It looks like it might be rolling over. So again, just mix. NASDAQ up down volume, on balance volume, oscillator. <laughs> We've got a reading that's usually coincident with uh, more frequently near the bottom of dips than the tops uh, before rollovers. So we just have indicator after indicator that's either middle of the range where you can't get high conviction about going long or short, um, uh, or top of the range starting to roll over like the McClellan summation which implies we should get a little bit more of a pullback than we've seen so far. And that wouldn't surprise me at all. Uh, this is not yet all the way down at the bottom, the PMO buy alls. And um, so I, I did want to go through some of these, but then you look at bullish percent, this looks like it's rolling over. Could it refresh in a long-term rally? Of course it could refresh just like 16 and 17 and 13, 14. So the only way you can win is company by company, buying things that have fallen enough, there's a margin of safety. So if the market falls more, yeah, maybe they'll fall incrementally more, but you know the minute the market starts to recover, they're gonna have dramatic outperformance. <clears throat> Even the NYSE McClellan summation here, looks like it's rolling over. It doesn't mean it can't refresh, but it does usually imply, you know, three to 8% pullback. And I think that wouldn't be a surprise. The skew is the one that we spent a lot of time on last week. That's the one that's really got me in line with being hedged. Um, this is an interesting one, the uh, Elliott wave pattern. I don't give it much credence, but it does have an interesting correlation when it starts to roll over we might see some volatility. And the VIX is uh, pretty darn complacent at these levels. So uh, that's why we have the two hedges on we've been talking about in recent weeks. Now, the other thing that we said is that, you know, maximum pain would be, you know, everyone had a view, the bulls were saying, we're gonna go to the moon, 5,600, 6,600. Uh, the bears were saying, um, you know, we're gonna crash. Uh, and I was saying that we do think we're gonna get a three to 8% pullback, um, but we're allocating 2% equity capital if we're wrong and the market keeps pushing higher, the high, high beta in our portfolio and the derivative overlay long, will dramatically outperform and eat that up. And if we're right, we're gonna create an extra five to 10 points of free capital that we can get long into year end. Uh, and that's how, how we've positioned ourselves. The only thing here that's looking like viable is utilities, which is usually what you see before um, uh, you get a correction because that's defensive, no one's defensive right now. And then when things get a little hairy, everyone will jump into the defensive like healthcare, which has had a massive sellout uh, uh, equity outflow in recent weeks because no one's bearish. Uh, I just like looking at these relative indexes and looking for things that are bottoming, like small caps relative to S&P, which we've looked at before, Chinese stocks relative to S&P, emerging markets relative to S&P, equal weight S&P, which we just covered earlier, China again, biotech again. These are all double bottoms looking like they're gonna, ready to just absolutely take off, and we love that. Um, even real estate, which we've talked about, everything interest rate sensitive. Now you could say, oh my God, we just got that CPI report. How can you think that rates are gonna go down? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, but um, I, I think we're right up at the edge and we'll look at some uh, technical indicators. We'll look at some fundamental indicators. But as we talked about with the uh, Bank of Japan stepping out and ECB this week starting to talk about cutting, and the Fed talking about uh, having quantitative tightening, i.e. stopping to drain liquidity from the system, I think you're going to see when they stop selling bonds on the open market, bonds are going to get bid again. And uh, and probably we're gonna see the 10 year below 3%, uh, not below 3%, below 4% within a matter of months again. Uh, biotech again, same thing. Um, 
Energy even looks a little stretched on this basis, by the way, with the exception of our beautiful Comstock resources that we're co-investing with. Jerry Jones, uh, excited about that. Um, healthcare, this is what I was talking about relative to the S&P. So all the defensives, defensives and interest rate sensitive. I got my amazing <clears throat> hedge fund tips mug from my buddies in Dallas. Thank you so much. I use this every week. Um, consumer discretionary, different pockets, um, and retail looks a little beaten down. So it just gives you a little bit of overview, cutting away from the noise. And this here is the 10-year yield. Thanks to my buddy over at RBC for sending over Slumer's work. 10-year uh, yield is uh, bumping up against resistance here. Maybe it pushes a little higher to just you know take everyone out to the shed. This is a counter trend move. We stand by that view. Uh, we think it's getting overdone here, maybe a little bit more extreme. But as the Fed comes out of being the biggest seller of bonds in the market and Bank of Japan has uh, moved out as being the buyer, I think net net when they stop selling, you know, 40, 50 billion dollars of bonds a month, uh, this is going to go right back down and continue the downtrend uh, in the intermediate term. S&P, he's showing some um, slowing of momentum on a weekly basis. We tend to agree. He's showing the, lot, the chart that we showed last week, which was this breaking down, the S&P through that trend line, showing the Russell uh, maybe has some sideways chop volatility. Uh, we, by the way, um, if I didn't finish that thought, you know, what I said was the biggest pain was going to be if it ground sideways so that neither the bulls nor the bears were correct and it just ate up all their premium. And that's usually what happens when you have such a contrast of high conviction views is uh, the maximum pain is to burn them both. And I think that's what the market's done in the last six weeks. Uh, Russell small cap, he's looking at some more consolidation before breaking out of this resistance. We agree. That's the view for the year. Copper is showing us that China, uh, that's a uh, copper, copper has a tendency. It's called Dr. Copper because uh, it has a PhD in economics and it precedes Japanese, uh, Chinese economic demand. You saw it before you had the massive rally in Chinese stocks into the 2021 uh, early 2022 peak, and then copper rolled over. Those stocks collapsed. Uh, copper hadn't recovered. Now copper started to break out, and China's starting to recover. We're going to see that. So uh, technical cycle, um, more on the momentum rollovers, the break of the trend line, which we covered. There were a couple other stocks uh, charts I wanted to show this. AAII sentiment survey came in, uh, let me just see, this morning. I think it's still pretty extreme. You've got 43% bullish. So it came down a little bit bearish, but uh, the retail were still a little giddy. So probably gonna knock a little stuffing out of them in the next week. Hang Sang is up against this uh, resistance here, ready to break out and get moving. Uh, we look forward to participating in that finally after a long wait. But in the scheme of things, was it really a long wait? I mean, you know, I look at this thing and everyone's always panicked on every headline. And I'm just like, look, we own a good company. The cash flows are going up, not down. I mean, in the scheme of things, when you look out, it's been 2022 was the low, mid-2022 to, so a year and a half. I mean, in the scheme of things to form a base, it's not the end of the world, especially when you get these parabolic moves right after it. Uh, I, I know no one believes that's coming, but uh, <laughs> don't worry about that. Just sell me your stock. I'm happy to add a few more shares. Um, and then 10-year uh, yield. So does it go up to 451? We'll see. This is just Fibonacci stuff. I, again, this is a counter trend rally as far as I'm concerned. The dollar bumped up against resistance, bounced off. So I think uh, this counter trend move again will fail and uh, start to resume downward. I think the Canadian dollar uh, short-term uh, downtrend is going to catch, catch a bid here at 73 and start to resume. All my Canadian friends that send me all these miners and commodity companies all the time, uh, just buy the loony, you'll be happy. Uh, and then um, uh, oil taken off here, <clears throat> gold 
silver. Again, this is all pricing in weaker dollar because this is all denominated in dollar terms. The dollar will follow these moves. Uh, and I think, let's see here. I think that was it. There was one or two others I wanted to cover really quickly. Oh, I think he had a PayPal chart in here. Uh, Intel coming back down. Remember, we have a third. We sold two thirds up here in the high 40s, um, took some profits, and then uh, have the third. I mean, if it got a bit lower, I mean, if it did go down to the low 30s, we might add that two third back, but I doubt it. We're, we're happy with the third in the house's money. We'll hold that for the long term. Here's the PayPal chart I wanted to show you. Further signs of bottoming, bottoming and holding above 52 to 58 to 62 support with 68 next resistance, followed by 79 and 88 from his lips to God's ears. Uh, if this thing goes to uh, 121 this year, uh, that, that alone will make it a, a, a beast, monster, amazing year uh, just on that one company alone. But, um, you know, even up to 88 is going to have massive contribution. So that's a, that's a meaningful position for us. And we're grateful to see it starting to break through these uh, periods of resistance. So, <clears throat> you know, we just covered wasted you know, 15 minutes on the market because everyone's interested in, in the, is the market going up or down? I, I really could care less. I like looking at individual companies. So what's the worst case scenario here? If we get this three to 8% pullback, well, this would pull back down to 57 for a minute and everyone would panic and we'd see if we had capacity to buy more shares or new clients that we could load up uh, and get them involved. Um, uh, but if it doesn't, if it grinds sideways, I think this works higher. And that's really all you can focus on is some of these health insurers are starting to look interested. They got smoked on that uh, Medicare cost stuff, UNH and uh, Humana and everything else. I, I've got to look more carefully and understand those. They haven't come down quite enough where I'm doing cartwheels to buy them, but um, they're, I'm starting to pay attention to them. Let's just put it, put it at that. Um, bank earnings start tomorrow. These all kind of look interesting. Will they bounce off this resistance and take a few more months to consolidate? Or are they going to break right through from earnings season? Uh, we're going to start to know the theme of that in the next week and a half, starting with the big banks tomorrow. And that's it from that. Uh, this was interesting. This is general economic stuff. <clears throat> Again, this is not stuff you see at the end of cycles. It's stuff you see at the beginning of cycles, which is services PMI now turning up. Uh, which is positive, and rail freight car loads continue to rise, pointing to a manufacturing recovery. <clears throat> and I think this is a critically important piece of the puzzle because MAG-7 kind of carried the water for a while while we did have a manufacturing recession for two years and uh, an actual technical recession in 2022 with two qu quarters of negative, consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. Um, and I think that's what the equal weight relative to cap weight is also telling us is all of these companies that have actually been in recession related to industrial uh, production and car loads and uh, uh, PMI, et cetera, are now starting to turn the corner. So you're going to see the Stanley Black & Deckers, the Generax, the GXO Logistics, which we're going to talk about, and others. Uh, really start to hum once again. Moving along, uh, more flows into value than growth of late, which is good to see. Uh, more flows into small caps and into mid caps. That's in line with our thesis. So the coil is getting uh, set to spring. And then this is the US dollar. So you've had the, you had this big drop in uh, at the end of 2022. And then you've been kind of consolidating sideways. I think we resume the downtrend uh, moving forward. This was automobile sales volume, absolutely shot the lights out. Um, 1.45 million units for the month of March was up 15.5% from February and an increase of 5.1% year on year. That tells you everything you need to know about the Cooper Standard story. VF Corp to roll out 300 additional mono brand retail stores uh, of Vans, North, uh, North Face, 
Timberland, Dickies, Smartwool, Jansport, and other active lifestyle brands has engaged with Dubai-based global retail con conglomerate GMG for its retail network uh, in the Middle East and Northern Africa and Southeast Asia over the next five years. This is not a company that is in survival mode. This is a company that is uh, taking bets on growth. Uh, and I think that's going to be a very constructive thing for Vans, North Face, Timberland, et cetera. Um, and that's that. So that was an interesting development. Then you have uh, Vans off the wall label is taking the past and making it better. So it's talking about the new ones, which we talked about the the new school, etc. I had some research here that I wanted to cover. Anyway, the research that we were going to post here was um, talking about channel checks or vans are showing very positive developments. Um, we will maybe post that tomorrow. But the, the name of the game is the channel checks are showing vans is starting to recover. And if vans recovers, this thing is going to hockey stick like nobody's business. Uh, maybe core inflation isn't as bad as it seems. That's okay. Okay, I got it. It's from Stiefel. Thanks to my buddy who sent it over. Uh, US Vans US checks reflect improving marketplace health, underpinning potential for uh, second half inflection. Vans US market checks point to improving marketplace health with much improved supply demand balance. While not yet indicative of inflection in end market demand, a cleaner channel and better pricing integrity for high volume styles suggest a healthier foundation upon to build upon that after a period of aggressing de aggressive destocking, including proactive channel reset actions in fiscal year, third quarter and fourth quarter. We expect sell-in came more closely to match sell-through. Data supports expectations for continued Vans margin improvement near term and lapping aggressive fiscal year 24 destocking. We see potential for uh, second half revenue inflection. Vans inflection and reducing net leverage uh, our central to any upside case for shares are some of the parts suggest the potential divestiture of Timberland and PAX could bring net leverage to three times by March of 2025 and shift the valuation framework to PE on earnings power of $2 plus in 26. Um, their 12 month target price is uh, $22, 13 times uh, 2025 estimates. Uh, I'd be surprised if they sold Timberland, but um, they definitely need to finish that Jansport sale. And I think that's going to be the next catalyst when, when you wake up and the PAX business is sold and they've paid down a bunch of debt and then they report that Vans is doing better. You know, it's interesting. I'm on their email list because as I shared with you, I bought the um, Lowlands in white and green, which are awesome. I wear them everywhere. Uh, uh, I used to get emails every day of like 50% off, 30% off, 20% off. I don't get that at all. I get just emails telling me about their new launches with no discounts, which uh, I like to see as an owner. So um, so this is a pretty detailed report on that thesis. This is one of the first that I've seen talking inflection, which is good to see. And then here is an article from Steve Goldstein over at uh, MarketWatch. Uh, maybe core inflation isn't as bad as it seems. And what they're pointing to is one component with the strongest acceleration in core CPI this month was motor vehicle insurance, which we've covered. That went to 2.6% um, uh, month on month from 0.9 in February, adding six basis points more to core CPI. But core PCE, which is the Fed favored in, uh, gauge, uses a different source for motor vehicle insurance that's been running much cooler. So, you know, that could have, I mean, it, it's just staggering what's what's happened to motor vehicle insurance prices. I mean, it's completely off the charts. Um, I'm not sure what resets it, but I do know that uh, sooner or later, these extremes correct, and when they and they went when they normalize, that it it happens overnight. So um, we'll leave it at that. Producer prices rise 0.2 percent in March, favorable surprise in inflation. That's good because CPI is lagging relative to PPI. 
the wholesale inflation precedes the retail inflation. So the fact that that's come down and came in slightly better than expected should bode well in coming months for the other. Alphabet stock naps fresh high, yay, and is only magnificent name to finish at a record. And now Amazon's on their back. So those are the two of the Mac 7 that we've owned since uh, October of 2022 when people are puking them out. And we've continued to hold them even though we had some caution in the last couple of months because they're super high quality businesses that we want to hold for a long term. We did peel off some Amazon options, but we kept the core stock position. Uh, Google unveils ARM-based Axion chips for AI as Intel details Gaudi 3 AI chip amid race against NVIDIA. Look, Intel came out this week and said ours is better than uh, NVIDIA's chip, the H100 processor. So um, we'll see. Remains to be seen. But the fact that they're in the game is something no one was betting on a year ago, and that's good to see. And we talked about them expanding internationally. I like this quote from Financial Times. After years of lying low, Ant is embarking on a global expansion drive as it appears to be nearing the end of its, quote, rectification campaign following the overhaul of its business to satisfy regulators. The company made an unexpected bid for Credit Suisse's Chinese securities unit in February and is working to rapidly expand its international payments business in search of growth in the post ma era. Quote, Ant may try expanding its financial business again. At the end of the day, finance is in its DNA, said Tilly Zhang, an analyst at GavCal Dragonomics. As long as there's a way in front of you, as is understandable, you're going to try. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's the name of the game. We own a third of that through Alibaba. Alibaba shares jump after founder Jack Ma reemerges re with praise of the Chinese giant's transformations. Um... So uh, Jack Ma said, praised the company's reorganization and change over the tumultuous past year, underwent an historic overhaul and sweeping management changes in a bid to return the Chinese technology uh, giant to growth, and so on. I just wanted to get the quote. Um, Over the past year, amid external and internal doubt and pressures, I have witnessed the birth of a strong and courageous Alibaba team, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Jack Ma steps into mistakes to boost Alibaba's morale in staff memo, eliciting support from Chinese embassy in the U.S. Uh, he said, quote, we hacked away at the big company disease and turned the company from a cumbersome organization into one that is simple and agile. Put the customers first, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, commercial property Beijing retail rents jumped by the most since 2019 with premium office space remaining under pressure. Uh, city's real, commercial real estate market recovered partially in the first quarter and is gearing up for further stabilization this year. Uh, that's good. And they're seeing demand for retail space. So it tells me that there's a indication that the consumer is re-emerging. Uh, and then a summary of the interview we covered last week with Joe Tsai. We, we uh, stepped on our own foot and um, he talks about large language models. He talks about the Chinese consumer. Good luck betting against them because uh, he's talking about income. To, uh, let's see. Great potential for growth in China's overall consumption rates that would eventually reach levels comparable with markets in the West. So if you if you can imagine four or five hundred million people with that type of buying power and they're well positioned to do that. And even more so, this note was out from CITC, uh, CITIC Securities. Baba's focus on core e-commerce yields results. Good shareholders return expected. Uh, issued a research report saying that their uh, fourth quarter revenue grew by about 6% with adjusted e EBITDA falling uh, and margins dropping, mainly due to increased investment in businesses like Taobao and Tmall, Alibaba, International Digital Commerce, uh, Kainau, Alibaba Life Service, etc. Um, and to focus its core business began to win initial success. So increased shareholder returns with a $4.8 billion share buyback 
which by the way, I think is the second largest quarterly buyback in history. Um, and, and so they raised their price target to a hundred bucks, big deal. But the key is that as they stated in the last earnings call, what the stock is basically is you have a 5% shareholder yield between buybacks and dividends that's embedded. Um, so what they what they effectively said is you got a T bill, but the difference is T bill yield, or yeah, T bill yield, but with unlimited upside equity uh, upside. Why? Because they've got eighty some billion dollars of cash. So you've got the security on the downside, you've got the 5% shareholder yield, and you have all the upside of these uh, things that they're doing. And to grow, if this turns out to be correct and revenues are up 6%, uh, the game is back on. I mean, that's really what all it comes down to. And what they're doing with Alibaba Cloud uh, is the same playbook that made them number one in Taobao and Tmall, which is they're cutting prices. Uh, this is time for international customers as AI generates surging demand. So what they wanna do is get them all locked into their ecosystem by cutting prices and driving their, consu uh, their, their competitors out because their competitors can't afford to cut prices. And um, so they can just sweep up international uh, users of its compute storage network database and big data products. Um, and that's that. So their competitors globally are Amazon and Google. Uh, outside of China, but they, they're competing with them on price at the moment. And uh, as far as their other Chinese competitors, they are well ahead. Uh, moving on to the article of the week, time or price stock market and sentiment results. So in this one, uh, we covered that. We went into some, uh, some of the notes ahead of the segment. First and foremost, markets can cor correct on price or time, which we covered. Um, we covered the BOJ stepping out as a global liquidity provider and then GXO Logistics, some high level stuff. They provide logistic services worldwide, warehousing and distribution order fulfillment e-commerce, reverse logistics, which is basically means when people return stuff, which can be up to 20 or 30% of orders for some of these e-commerce e providers. They handle that and other supply chain services. Stock's down 50% off its 2021 highs. Uh, this is one of Brad Jacobs' companies. He's, he owns, he's chairman now, he owns 1.7 million shares, um, which about $85 million. And um, this stock, the reason it sold off, it sold off in concert with the shift. If you remember in the pandemic, there was a huge surge for goods when everyone was at home. Then they fulfilled those needs, the world opened up, they went to services, and now things have been moving back into goods uh, and or a more balanced good service normalized environment and they're going to benefit from that. They've got $10 billion of revenues last year which is about 2.2% of a $450 billion TAM. To uh, put that in perspective, 40% of that TAM give or take is uh, companies that outsource their supply chain, 60% uh, still in source, but the huge opportunity is that more and more of those companies are now outsourcing. So they're gonna be able to take a lot of share as the basic second largest provider in the space. Um, $558 billion, uh, $558 million of operating cash flow, trading at $6 billion market cap, and their um, cash on cash return for every dollar deployed is over 30%, which is huge. It's called operating return on invested capital every incremental dollar. So when they're compounding capital at that level and I can buy it at a 50% discount on top of it and they've got a clean balance sheet and they've got a management that respects capital and are good stewards of capital and good allocators of capital in a business with a nice moat in a fragmented space where they have a huge roll up pipeline acquisition target pipeline and they could take advantage of multiple arbitrage which simply means that if they're um you know if, if their multiple is 20 times they can buy these smaller 
businesses at 15 times or 12 times and it's immediately accretive. And then they add the synergies to it and then they add um, the scale to it and what you see is uh, uh, smart deals that don't take a year to be accretive. They take um, you know a few minutes to be accretive and, uh, and that's how they continue to get these high operating return on invested capital. So um, they'll continue to grow organically high single digits uh they'll they'll recover to next year and then uh inorganic or acquisitive growth uh double digits plus and what's interesting is i was looking at because if you look at the normal return on invested capital like if you screen for it it's low single digits and it can mislead you and the reason i dug a little deeper is because it was brad jacobs and i'm halfway through listening to his book how to make a few billion dollars and um and, and, and then I looked at URI, United Rentals, and I started to understand that also if you look explicitly at their stated return on invested capital, total capital debt plus equity uh, divided by net income, it was kind of like high single digits, low double digits. I'm like, how did this stock go up like 100 bag uh, plus with such a low return on capital over such a short period of time? And um, we'll, we'll get into that in a second. Let's pivot here to inflation. Um, we covered that last night. And, and the name of the game here, again, just look at, number one, the weighting of motor vehicle insurance, and number two, the, the jump. Also, motor, motor vehicle repairs, which is going to help our advanced auto parts. So uh, cost of repairing vehicles has jumped, which should bode well for do-it-yourself sales at advanced auto parts. Uh, p- position and also new car sales, which helps Cooper Standard. So, in other words, if you have an old car, which the average car on the road is 13.5 years, and you're bringing it to the garage to get fixed, your your cost to repair that jumped 11.6%. Uh, so, you have two choices: either go get a new car finally, or uh, do it yourself and go to Advanced Auto Parts and buy that. And we got them both covered. Uh, you're also going to note that, okay, and then uh, here's what the Fed whisperer Nick Timoreos had to say about it. Um, cuts look like they've pushed, been pushed out to at least July for the time being, which is restrictive. Now, that could change with the core CPI, which we covered as um, uh, motor vehicle insurance is accounted for differently, and that's the Fed's favored gauge in which case June comes back on the table, but right now it's basically off the table till July. Um, So, you know, he talks about what Biden had to say about it, uh, postponed postponed to July, the car insurance being the big factor. Now, he also quotes Powell and he's the Fed whisperer. And it's interesting, he resurfaced this quote from Powell saying, quote, we're in a situation if we ease too much too soon, we could see inflation come back. And if we ease too late, we could do unnecessary harm to employment. Powell said last month, we do see the risks as two-sided, so it is consequential to start cutting rates. Um, economists at Goldman and UBS, who previously anticipated three cuts this year starting in June, are now anticipating two cuts starting in July and September, respectively. Last mile of inflation. Now, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, the Fed is planning to cut quantitative tightening in half, according to the Fed minutes we we, uh, saw yesterday, which not a lot of people are really emphasizing. This is highly accommodative. Uh, Will actually be good for bids in bonds and uh, compressed yields, especially because M2 money supply is still well above trend. It's interesting to see this. So we've got an excess you know, call it three and a half trillion dollars of liquidity in the system still, and they're going to uh, cut quantitative tightening in half, slower the pace of the runoff and do it fairly soon. They've been allowing 60 billion in treasuries to mature every month, but could lower that. So maybe they cut it down to 30, 30 trillion, uh, 30 billion of less supply every single month uh, is going to be very, very constructive, especially with Bank of Japan exiting their unlimited printing and buying of global bonds, uh, which had helped us refinance at lower rates for some time. 
So officials have been allowing up to 60, 60 billion in US treasuries and 35 billion of mortgage backed uh, to wind down its $9 trillion balance sheet. So if they, they're, they're not gonna touch the mortgage backed is what they're saying, but if they take out, you know, if you got 95, 45 and they, they only roll off 15 billion in treasuries, you're gonna see yields compress and bonds get bid. And this is kind of the headline behind the headline that no one's paying attention to that is gonna be very, very constructive as we get towards the back half of the year. So I uh, was very interested to see that. And it was also interesting that Timoros covered both of those stories in the same day. And the reason they're motivated to do that uh, is that signs that a cash surplus in money markets are diminishing. The Fed allows money market firms and others to park extra cash that would otherwise end up in reserves in an over, overnight reverse repurchase facility. That facility has shrunk to around $440 billion in recent weeks from $2.3 trillion one year ago. Once that facility is nearly drained of cash, forecasting demand for bank reserves could be more uncertain, raising the risk that the Fed goes too far. Market participants say the Fed needs to manage runoff carefully because banks may need more reserves than it realizes. That is because of regulations that require banks to hold higher quality assets to meet unexpected demands for cash. Moreover, for 15 years, banks have had so much cash as a result of the Fed's operations that the interbank market where banks lent reserves to each other has atrophied. Market participants and Fed officials are less confident reserves can quickly go from banks with extra to those in need. Uh, overly rapid reductions in bank reserves could outpace money markets' ability to redistribute reserves to banks that need them the most. That would risk pressures that could force us to stop balance sheet normalization prematurely, said Fed Dallas Fed President Lori Logan last week. Logan's views carry weight because she served as the senior New York Fed executive responsible for managing the Fed assets five years ago when they had the liquidity shock. So uh, it seems like she learned from her, less, her lesson and wants to be a little proactive. The chart we posted last week with the S&P breaking this multi-month trend line, now that has morphed into a further correction. So we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, will our hedges work out as anticipated a three to 8% pullback or will the market continue to correct in time flat the last five to six weeks versus price. We don't know which which is why, is why we are positioned for all eventualities. Small levered hedges and shorts plus long equity portfolio. You look at the QQQ, it's been sideways for over seven weeks, uh, six and a half, seven weeks right now. It's made zero gains. Most people wouldn't know that. They think it's gone straight up. No, it's been consolidating gains. Does it break down or does it just grind sideways? We're gonna find out. Same with the semiconductors, it peaked about six weeks ago, been grinding sideways ever since, uh, and moving on to GXO Logistics. So this is a new position across portfolios with space. Uh, it is one of Brad Jacobs' companies. For those of you who don't know Brad Jacobs, he has the Midas Touch. He successfully executed five public company, multi-billion dollar roll-ups, and then wrote a book, How He Did It, How to Make a Few Billion Dollars. I love that title. I'm halfway through it. Uh, it's what I do at Swim Meets. Now, here's how he made $4 billion for himself and 10 tens of billions for his shareholders. First and foremost, um, <clears throat> he had uh, XPO Logistics and then the spinoffs GXO Logistics and RXO. RXO, I don't really like the freight business uh, brokerage. Uh, it's less, I think there's a less durable moat than there is for GXO. Um, in J Jacobs, in 1989, he did United Waste Systems. He ultimately sold that roll up to waste management for $2.5 billion. Then he did uh, United Rentals, uh, which it was a roll up of uh, equipment rental dealers throughout North America. And then in 2011, he uh, started uh, did XBO with $150 million investment. And then out of XBO came RXO, GXO, and XPO. And just to give you an idea, you know, if you bought URI in the great financial crisis lows uh, at two and a half dollars, it went, it's it's now up at, you know, $700. So what's that, uh, 25 times seven, you know, <laughs> unbelievable, 175 bagger. Uh, even if you bought it at the top in 2007, you'd have uh, one, almost a 20 bagger, 25 bagger. Um, and then XBO Logistics, if you'd bought <laughs> in the great financial crisis at 87 cents, it's now, uh, 
120 bucks, so you'd have over 100 bagger. I mean, here's two that you could have 100 to 200 baggers investing alongside. So after kind of getting into his book, I'm like, I want to invest with this guy. Uh, he's got QXO Logistics, which is private right now. You could probably invest in private, but I don't like to do private deals. I don't like my capital tied up. Uh, I don't like the opportunity cost of that. Um, uh, I'll probably just wait for it go, to go public, let it rally, let it cool off, and then buy it after the initial hype, uh, and then hold it for you know the long term. So where could I get uh, exposure to co-invest with this this guy? Uh, URI is already the barn is already you know, I'm not going to buy it at 700 bucks. You know I, <laughs> I buy things down, not up. XBO same story. Uh, so the next best thing was. Uh, RxO and GxO. RxO, I don't love the business, um, and GxO is uh, the sweet spot for me. So we now have the opportunity to get in one of the spinoffs of XBO at 50% markdown from uh, its uh, 2021 highs, and we believe that's just getting started. GxO gets paid per client unit, so as the economy sees on from goods consumption to services consumption, the perception of the stock fell, even though the performance of the underlying business is held together. As a matter of fact, cash flow, free cash flow revenues. Uh, they've all grown. The balance sheet has gotten healthier. Um, um, and it's actually kind of surprising how they've held up. If you look at revenues, they've grown from 6 billion to 10 billion in just uh, basically three years. And then um, you've got uh, free cash flow has basically gone from 65 million to 284 million. So, you know, more than 4x, 300% gain in a few years. And the operating leverage is is really just kicking in. And that's in a in an environment with massive headwinds as uh, goods took a backseat to services. And now as it normalizes, how do we know this? It's the same story as Stanley Black & Decker, Generac, even Intel, where they all overstocked, the customer stopped uh, had already bought all the goods they wanted by 2021. They've worked, spent six quarters working through it and now we're at the inflection and all the operating leverage and GXO is perfectly positioned uh, for that moving forward. So uh, a little bit about the business from the 10K, largest pure play contract logistics provider in the world and a foremost innovator in an industry propelled by strong secular tailwinds. We provide customers with high value added warehousing, distribution, order fulfillment, e-commerce, reverse logistics, and other supply chain services differentiated by our ability to deliver technology enabled customized solutions at scale. As of December, as of the end of the year, they had 131,000 team members operated in 974 facilities uh, worldwide, totaling 199 million square feet of space, primarily on behalf of large corporations that have outsourced their where warehousing, distribution, and other related activities to us. Our revenue is diversified over 1,000 customers, including many multinational corporations across various verticals. We're going to cover some of them, whether it's LVMH, Apple, Nike, uh, Red Bull, Pepsi, et cetera, and move their goods with high efficiency through supply chains. From the movement of goods arrive at our warehouses through fulfillment, distribution, and management of return products. Our customer base includes many blue chip leaders in sectors that demonstrate high growth and or durable demand with significant growth potential through customer outsourcing of logistics services. They have the most advanced warehouse solutions in the world, technological innovations, process efficiencies, efficiencies and reliable outcomes, increasing visibility of supply chain, decreasing fulfillment times and mitigating environmental impacts while being a proactive in identifying potential improvements. Uh, technology, uh, the industry needs scale technology players like GXO to deliver these uh, complex solutions. GXO was an early adopter of technology and more than 30% of our warehouses are technology enabled compared to an industry average of 10%. Technology enables us to add value to customers end to end. That investment continues, which is why they have a high, such a high uh, operating return on invested capital, which I think is going to continue to expand. And um, the uh, management platform is built in, on the cloud to speed the deployment of new ways to increase efficiency and leverage our footprint. Uh, labor and inventory management, productivity, intelligent warehouse automation, and predictive analytics. They also have a lot of robots, by the way, and they're going to have more robots, which, uh, as you can understand, will increase their margins. Predictive machine learning, da -da -da -da, cost effective. Okay. 
Our intelligent warehouse automation includes deployments of autonomous robots and collaborative robots, cobots, automated so sortation systems, automated guided vehicles, goods to person systems, and wearable devices. These are all effective ways to deliver critical improvements in speed, accuracy, and productivity. Importantly, automation also enhances safety and overall quality. We have found that autonomous goods to person systems, cobots, which assist workers with the inventory picking process can improve labor productivity. Stationary robot arms can repeat demanding tasks with greater precision than is possible manually. Robots are particularly valuable in markets with labor shortages and where wage inflation can erode customer margins. So they're they're pivoting and that makes them more efficient and their margins increase and that's where they get the scalability in the moat. We provide our customers with high value add distribution. Uh, 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 42% of our revenue was from omni-channel retail, 15% from technology and consumer electronics, 14% from food and beverage, 11% from industrial manufacturing, 11% from consumer packaged goods, 7% from other industries. And their top competitors are SIVA, DHL is really the big one, DSV, Geotis, ID Logistics, Kuhn and Nagel and Ryder. Um, the other thing that's really interesting that got my interest, as you know, I've been looking for after we made a multi-bagger in Rolls-Royce in a shorter period of time than expected, um, we were looking for another way to play the UK recovery. And I think there are going to be a few stories in the UK recovery. It's not just the country recovering. It's, it's in line with our thesis that a lot of currencies over the next couple of years are going to appreciate relative to the US dollar. Uh, including, uh, and um, I think in a material way, the British pound. And guess what? X uh, GXO Logistics gets the majority of its revenue from the United Kingdom. They do $3.6 billion out of the UK versus uh, $2.9 billion out of the US, and then $831 million out of the Netherlands, $830 out of France, $529 out of Spain, 382 out of Italy and 633 out of others for 9.7 billion. <laughs> By the way, in some of these countries like France and uh, other areas where the labor laws are interesting, those robots come in handy. Uh, and I think they're ahead of the curve on that. So uh, not only will we get the benefit of a high return on operational capital business trading at a discount with, with, uh, uh, massive galloping growing free cash flow uh, uh nice organic growth uh meaningful double digit inorganic or acquisitive growth by people that know how to do acquisitions not that just do dumb acquisitions for acquisition's sake um but i think the bigger bite at the apple is going to be the currency play and the uk recovery play that no one's looking for that's a headwind on the stock that's going to wind up being a, a double tailwind which has got us pretty exciting just how we hit it perfectly on rolls royce i think we're going to be right in line on gxo i do hope it drops into the 40s before it goes in, in you know up uh, a lot but um uh, we have a good size very good size starter position and uh and if we get some weakness hopefully some mark market weakness we will pounce to get even more gxo uh, in coming weeks and months. Uh, time will tell. More granular explanation of the business from the Investor Day presentation around the time of the spinoff. Um, you should click on there and read through it. Again, this is all opinion, not advice. Uh, this is what we're doing personally and for our clients. Uh, we don't know what you should do. You should talk with a financial advisor before you do anything. We deal exclusively with accredited investors and qualified institutions. Go to hedgefundtips.com and click on terms as always. Um, uh, okay, so here were the results. Uh, and this, this is why the stock is down because their organic growth revenue uh, in Q4, which was the trough, uh, uh, was negative, And then their total growth was positive because their acquisitions have been highly accretive and they can add massive synergies in the fragmented business in which they live. That said, they generated over a half a billion dollars of free uh, of operating cash flow, three hundred billion dollars of free cash flow. The debt's gone down a little bit. Generated uh, two bucks a share in earnings. That's going to go up meaningfully over the next year, year and a half. And these are some of the clients: uh, Nike, LVMH, Mars, Red Bull, Pepsi, uh, etc. And then in their PFS acquisition, 
which they've just completed. They picked up a lot of amazing clients like Pandora, the jewelry, uh, Champion, um, a number of uh, on the, the uh, sneaker company. Uh, many of these you'll recognize as you Shiseido as you go through them. Um, Lancome. So you name it, they got them. Uh, strong new contract wins. They actually picked up a billion dollar run rate of, of new annualized revenue in 2023. So that's a big, big deal. Uh, they won 32% from competitors, 29% from new activity, and 39% from outsourcing. Uh, this is huge. Look at their biggest growth. And this is what I'm saying. 60% of that 40, 450 billion market, uh, uh, TAM, total addressable market, is from those who insource all of their uh, supply chain and distribution, uh, their biggest wins were converting those people who had it in-house to going um, uh, uh, outsourcing it. And, and the pitch is so easy. I mean, if you're pitching a public company, it's like, look, we got Nike, we got Pepsi, we got all these companies. If you wanna increase your earnings with less work, just outsource it to us, do what you do best, we'll do what we do, do best and your earnings will go up, whatever, it'll go up 20, 30, 40% with no additional changes in your business. And what CEO who's got a ton of stock options and a responsibility to his shareholders is gonna say, uh, no, we don't want an increase in earnings and an increase in margins, why would we do that? Uh, well, because all your competition's doing it, and if you don't do it, they're gonna leave you in the dust. So uh, that's what GXO does, is makes people more competitive, more efficient, and provides an invaluable service at scale, which now very few people uh, basically only DHL, DHL, it's gonna move into over time an, a, a duopoly type of business uh, where I think they're gonna have the upper hand with some of the technology moves that they're making. Um, balance sheet clean, cash flow good. I mean, I love being in companies, great companies with great management that um, are marked down, that have pristine balance sheets and and monster free cash flow because that gives them all the runway they need for the industry inflection to just carry them away like Munger would say the Lollapalooza effect and catch and ride the wave which which is coming over the next two years this is how they calculate it and I think this is why a lot of people miss this stock because you know if you look at standard return on equity it's the high single digits right now and that's in a trough year so that alone will be double digits but if you look at their business correctly because if you the other thing is What's crazy is they got 1.6 billion of debt, but when you look, when you look at the return on invested capital calculation, they're showing like four billion dollars of debt plus the equity over net income, and you wind up with the low single digit. But two billion dollars of that debt is leases because remember, about a year ago, you had to start recording leases at as debt on the balance sheet, which which impacts the return on invested capital, which historically uh, leases were just a standard kind of expense that, that you thought about. Now they're treating it as debt and that can skew for a business like this that has a lot of uh, leases, uh, it can skew those calculations. So when you look at it properly as their CEO Barish has laid out here in, in this slide, um, the ratio of operating return on invested capital is calculated as adjusted EBITDA net of income taxes paid divided by the average invested capital. And uh, for that quarter, I'm sorry, for that year ended was 36%, which is enormous. So if you're compounding capital at 36%, you're doubling your money every two years, rule of 72. Uh, and I get to buy it at a 52 uh, at a 50 percent off and invest side by side with uh, one of the greatest wealth builders of all time in Brad Jacobs, who's got 1.7 million shares. And um, for me, there's not a lot to think about, especially when I'm buying it at the price that it was spun, which is mind boggling. And the business has grown since 2021 till 2024. Uh, I'm getting it at the spin price and free cash flow is up 4x, over 4x, up over 300%. I'm getting it at the same price and revenues are up um, if 
from six billion to ten billion. So not quite double, but uh, eighty percent. Mind-boggling. I love. I love it. So. Uh, what else do I have to say about that? Not, nothing. <laughs> Short-term market, uh, some of the uh, extreme sentiment is wearing off a little bit as we covered on the AAII. CNN Fear and Greed is at 54, down from 62 last week. And the National Association of Active Investment Managers, they dropped down to, I think, 84% this week. Let me see where they came down to. Yeah, 81% equity exposure down from 104. So again, it, it, some of these things are pointing to that we're going to get a little cooling. Um, and that's perfectly fine with us. All right, let's move on to earnings, exploration, and production sector. Top 30 weights of the XOP. Uh, last 60 days, their earnings, cumulative earnings power estimates were revised up by 36 basis points. In the last 60 days for next year, revised down 62 basis points, uh, six tenths of 1%. Industrials top 30 weights in the last 60 days, the earnings power was revised down by 1.7% for this year and down 1% for next year. So I think we, uh, you know, a little pullback would be in order. However, they have set the bar very low for earnings this quarter. Uh, they took it down from 5.7% at the end of last year for Q1. 5.7% growth to 3.2%, which means you could wind up with, you know, 3, 4% beat, um, you know, which is not bearish, uh, other than the fact that you have uh, 20 and a half times forward earnings, which is a little rich. Uh, but that's the story. So again, crosswinds, crosswinds. So like, tune out the noise and focus on companies, great companies like Cooper Standard, like GXO Logistics, like Stanley Black & Decker, like Generac, like Alibaba, like, um, you know, all the ones that we cover on this incredibly amazing, fun podcast that I'm so grateful that you guys tune in to listen to and, uh, and, and get great value. And I appreciate that feedback. Uh, all right. So we went through the CPI numbers and the implications of that. The PPI came in a little bit better, um, which is nice to see. And on to the Ask Me Anything question. So for those of you who just like the podcast, we're finished for this week. For those of you who love the Ask Me Anything question, we're going to start right now. And that's going to take some extra time. So I hope you'll stay with us. We've got some great questions this week. So Sven Thorstam. Um, Sven, we covered actually. Okay, so that's good. We covered that Clarivate and uh, Erakuya. And those are two uh, UK companies, but now we got our UK play with GXL, which is pretty awesome. Next is Daniel D. Uh, yeah, Daniel, sorry I missed that one. He's asking about Sprouts Farmers Market. He says, huge insider selling makes me want to short it. Yes, I know people sell for many reasons but it also has a sh huge short interest. Um, all right, well, let's see. I think, okay, so this thing's had a big run. You wanna short it and let's see why. Well, the margins are increasing, the revenues are increasing, their cash flow is stable. Um, let's see what the balance sheet looks like. $200 million of cash. Hundred twenty five million dollars of debt. Two hundred million dollars of free cash flow. I mean, have at it. I mean, this is not the type of business I want to short. Now you can say it's a little overvalued in the short term, and you might be right, but um, 
you know, look, yeah, it's run a lot, but it's also had performance. Uh, you probably get a pullback. I, I just, you know, timing this is uh, short interest I could care less about. Uh, huge insider selling. It's, it's not a great way to make money. So like Warren Buffett said, uh, why are you trying to jump over seven foot poles when you could find one foot poles to step over? Uh, and I think you're trying to win an Olympic gold medal. The problem is, is you're not going to get paid more than the bronze in this one and just go for the easy bronze that you can do. Uh, the, the last question you ask is why people blow up their accounts when they start in, start in this business, which is how can we tell if a short squeeze is coming? You can't. And, and anyone who thinks they can is going to blow up their account. So if they get lucky and they think they predicted uh, when a short squeeze comes or, you know, the exact time to short a particular stock, they're kidding you and they're kidding themselves. And the, and the bigger their first win, the, the more money they make without pain, uh, the faster they're going to give it back because they're going to give it back all in one because they get overconfidence bias and uh, they don't realize that they were just lucky versus good. Uh, and uh, and they get smoked. So if you're playing the wrong game, focus on getting rich over time in a predictable way that you can sleep at night versus trying to get rich overnight and blowing up your account. And like Warren Buffett said, rule number one, don't lose money. Rule number two, don't forget rule number one. This framework that you have, and we try to impart our framework each week. Um, and by the way, uh, first off, I just want to acknowledge you for listening because you're trying to educate yourself. Number two, I want to acknowledge you for having the courage to send in a question so you're on the right track. Um, so what I'm going to say here is the framework that you're currently exposed to that's influencing you to ask this type of question is a framework that's setting you up for bad outcomes. Um, take a step back, take a breath, take some time to learn, educate yourself, and I think if you take a longer term view buying high quality businesses when they're on sale, cash generative, good balance sheets, decent estimate of their moat, uh, you're gonna do a lot better and you're gonna see that small pile grow into a bigger pile, compound into a bigger pile. As a matter of fact, I have this table of Warren Buffett's net worth uh, over time. And basically by like 44, he was only worth 20 million bucks. And then by like um, 66, he was worth like I'm, I'm cuffing these numbers, but it was literally, I think it's 66, he was worth like 1.3 billion. And then like 20 years later, he was worth 100 billion. So that snowball really grows and grows. And by the way, that account, like you see him, he's, his net worth is accounted as like 100 billion. What people forget, he's already given away like 100 billion. He'd be like the world's wealthiest guy over and over and over again if he didn't give away already like 100 billion dollars. And uh, I think he done that on purpose, by the way. Uh, let let Bezos and Musk take all the heat and uh, all the phone calls for charitable donations while he just kicks back in Omaha with his uh, dilly bars at Dairy Queen and uh, doesn't have to take all the media attention for richest man in the world. Uh, George Rovney. Uh, Hi, Tom. Love the podcast. I've gained material benefit from your work. We'll become a client once liquid assets are sufficient. There's this fascinating... Oh, by the way, um, as we said on the bottom of the article, uh, congratulations to all the new clients that came in during our early Q1 raise. We are now reopened to smaller accounts of a million dollar plus again starting today and will remain open for the next two weeks. So this is our Q2 raise we're doing early in the quarter because uh, we have a couple of people already waiting uh, to come in and um, so we wanna be able to fulfill them. And for those of you who've been waiting for the next opening, it's now to see if you qualify and to take advantage of this opening, click here. Here is just go to hedgefundtips.com and click on the button on top that says money management and you'll see uh, the requirements of, of what you need. Uh, this is not a solicit solicitation. It's uh, you know just setting up a phone call to see whether it makes sense to move ahead. And if so, uh, you'll go through all the required paperwork and we're happy to do that. Uh, as for the five and $10 million people, uh, you can come in whenever you want. <laughs> we work at your leisure, but the smaller accounts, we'd love to get everyone all set at once. So for the remaining 10 weeks of the quarter, we can just focus on what we do best, which is deliver this value 
uh, but more importantly, deliver value for the money management clients and be focused exclusively on markets all day long versus uh, helping clients get set up. So um, moving along. So if that's interesting, uh, you, you know how to take advantage of that. Uh, next one is, okay, so. Da, 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 da. Okay, so he's asking about, some guy says that the first change in China will be from dire to slightly less dire and we'll suck huge amounts of capital that way, but at the expense of the India trade. We covered that last week, how the money is moving out of India and into China. Uh, I wonder whether this is his view on EVs, uh, whether whether his view on EVs will negatively impact CPS, imminent bloodbath for US and European automakers at the hands of Chinese EVs. Number one, we're not letting them in in material way. Number two, they have Chinese clients. Um, prevented only by huge tariffs. Uh, thanks for all you do. I tell everyone about your podcast. Uh, no, won't hurt C CPS. Um, and, uh, and that's that. Next, uh, Bob Johnson. Uh, Elon just announced... Robo Taxi unveil on 8 ADA this year, assuming this takes some time to get going. Eventually, the result is less non Tesla cars on the road, especially in big cities over time. He's been talking about Robo Taxis for like 10 years. Um, self taxis are charging 50 cents to $1 per mile. I don't believe this will impact Cooper Standard's three year growth trajectory, especially if their parts are being used by Tesla in multiple vehicles. But assuming worst case scenario that Tesla phases out Cooper Standard and Robo Taxis take off faster than expected. Would you factor this into your model? Absolutely not. Um, number one, it'll be a short-term boom. And number two, we'll be out of this thing in three years anyway. Uh, at a multi, multi We're already at a multi-bagger, but at a multi-multi-multi-bagger. Uh, thanks as always, and some of the best investment content anywhere on the web, Bob. Bob, thank you so much for sending that in. I appreciate it. Uh, Matt Mahler, uh, thank you for your knowledge. You share video cast, podcast, or prices. Can you take a look at Nike? Started a 5% uh, position at 90, was leaning, the price continues to fall. I think this can be a double over the next few years. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, Matt, I think you're spot on. I don't even need to go into that. I like, I like that thesis. I think it's a China play. We would probably have the position, but we've got enough exposure to China with Alibaba. Uh, but otherwise, we would probably have Nike uh, as a position somewhere at these levels. We've looked at it a million times. I wouldn't be, it wouldn't shock me if Nike went down into the, you know, 80s uh, before it uh, reverses. But um, I think I think your thesis is right there. I don't love it. I like it. I'll put it at that. Uh, Ramiel, in the interest of time. Uh, from Hong Kong, big fan of your work and podcast for the past year. Thank you for all your hard work. What do you think about AIA stock? Uh, 1299 Hong Kong keeps making all the watch lists and had a good report in the last week. Fortunately, the stock has been taking a big beating post results. I'm not sure why. Um, okay. I generally don't like, let, let's just take a look at it. All right. A I A. Uh, let's do this a different way. Twelve ninety nine. There we go. What did it do? AIA is life insurance financial services. Uh, my guess is there's real estate risk in their portfolio, uh, without knowing anything more. Uh, let's just see what the business looks like. I wouldn't buy a company like this. Um, yeah, I mean, look, look at the free cash flow growth on this thing. Uh, revenues have dropped. What is that all about? Margins are up. Yeah, this is not the type of business I would buy. I, I don't want any financial company in China uh, at all. I'll just leave it at that. Just stay away. Uh, I think your framework got you to the right conclusion, but just experience. These are the intangibles that you can only pick up over time. Don't buy don't buy a financial company in China. Um, you can buy it indirectly. Like we own the biggest one called Ant Financial. We own 33% through our ownership of Alibaba. So if that 
financial services sector grows, they'll be the biggest beneficiary and will 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 benefit by owning a third of it. But the standalones, um, too opaque for me. Uh, Lai Dapata. You mentioned that Japan will be raising and Fed will be lowering. How much can Japan raise given their big debt? It doesn't matter the magnitude, it matters the direction. Um, also your thoughts on Yellen's views of overproduction. I mean, she's right, but it's not gonna really stop. So um, we just wanna be the toll taker with Alibaba. Let them produce tons of stuff. We take a little, t you know, a little piece of every transaction. They keep pushing consumption because they want to be more like the West. We take a little piece of every transaction and uh, it's a happy day. Michael Chu, Tom, thanks for the great podcast as usual. Hope you enjoyed UK. Did you manage to get a Savile Row bespoke suit while getting a jacket and shoes? No, I did not have time. I only got the jacket and shoes. I've got a great tailor in New York City uh, that I'm happy with, so I'll stick with him. But I do think the next time I'm over, I'm going to find the best tailor there, get all my measurements done, and um, and then just have them on order so I can just call them once a year and, and get a few things done. I want to ask your opinion on WPP. Uh, I already got my UK stock. It's called GXO, but let me take a look at this for you, my man. All right, WPP. Let's have a look-see-loo. Wow, very uneven type of business. Um, sounds like a transactional business, WPP. Which, I mean, this stock has gone nowhere for 24 years. So tell me why that's gonna change. And I'll tell you if I like it. All right, uh, Creative Transformation Company. What the hell is that? Okay. Uh, provides communications, experience, commerce, and technology services in North America, UK, uh, global integrated agencies, public relations, and special. I, this is a low quality, but I, I don't like this type of business. Um, I can't understand it, and I can't predict whether they're going to have a good couple of years or a bad couple of years. I mean, the only thing you have going for it, it's down 60%, but um, let's see here. Let's look at the income statement. <sighs> Revenues have been flat for 10 years. I, I, yeah, I don't like these low growth businesses that aren't down materially and don't have some clear plan for a turnaround. Um, free cash flow has is down 50% from its 2020 peak. I think there are much I think there are higher better uses of capital. I think Okay, they are optimistic that their future growth is AI and technology, which is a big drive. I, I this sounds like a scam from management. It's like you've been you've delivered zero shareholder value for 24 years and now you're going to drop the words ai into your conference call and think you're going to get a bid uh good luck hard pass um i do thank you for sending in the question and it's not to be critical at all because i think it's probably good for a trade and maybe it goes up to 70 75 bucks but um i think that's good learning for everyone else just kind of like tell me something new like you've never performed and now you're going to drop this buzzword into your conference call and think you're going to get my bid, uh, hard pass. All right. Oz, Oz Smaja, been listening to your podcast for over a year now, have been recommending your podcast to everyone I know who's interested in investments. Thank you for that. By the way, uh, for those of you who are not clients uh, or, or involved in any way, uh, first off, thank you for your support. Best way you can... Um, um, show your appreciation would be number one hit the like and subscribe button on youtube the more people that subscribe and hit the button uh which it's obviously working you guys have been doing it we're growing uh and leave comments that 
causes engagement, which causes them to show the video to more people when they log into YouTube, which causes more people to watch it, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a benevolent spiral. Um, and to share it with one person you know who would benefit from this type of education, uh, information. So, or I think we have to call it entertainment. But anyway, it's in the disclaimer. Click on terms at headfronttips.com. Uh, what are your thoughts on Duratech? A uh, profitable microcap Australian company that's shown impressive growth. Revenues growing at 34% CAGR, EBITDA 24% CAGR. Companies led by three founders, each owning 11% of shares. Clean balance sheet. Uh, let's take a look. Oz, it's called DUR. Duratech. Okay, looks like cash flow is declining from what I could see here. Revenues are up. Margins collapsed last year, started to recover a little bit. Uh, let's see here, financial analysis, income statement. Yep, revenue is definitely growing. Let's take a look at the balance sheet. 39 million. Not much debt. Cash flow. Free cash flow is down from 13.2 million down to two and a half. You probably want to just verify that that's correct. Why is that happening? Uh, what is the business? Provision of assessment, protection, remediation, refurbishment services, a range of assets, primarily steel and concrete infrastructure in Australia, defense mining, industrial buildings and facades, energy defense segment, capital facilities, infrastructure, and estate works programs, product metal preventive maintenance programs, building and facades, private assessment, oil and gas industry, grading, remediation, cladding, durability. Yeah, I mean, this is an interesting business. It seems like a cyclical business uh, that shouldn't be a public company. It should just be a private company that throws off cash to the owners, but for some reason they want it public. Um, I wouldn't invest in that personally because it's dependent on like, sounds like it's dependent on government contracts and for a tiny little company like that. Um, yeah, I, I would just understand if that if that free cash flow number is correct, if it dropped off that quickly, why? And I, I think what you're gonna find with this business is it's less predictable than you think. Um, but what I'm trying to figure out is whether it's come down enough. Um, I like the idea of co-investing with the owners. I generally avoid micro caps, so that's partially the reason I'm not excited about it. Let me see what they've done with the share count. Uh, my guess is they haven't issued a lot of shares because they would be hurting themselves unless they issued all the shares to themselves, then that would be hurting you. Uh, yeah, I mean, the share counts up 20%, more than that, 30%, just about 30% in uh, three years. I don't like that. I don't know why they're issuing all this stock. Find out who's getting the stock. Did they use it for acquisitions? And at what valuation did they give out the stock? Or are they just paying themselves all that money? Or are they raising capital all the time? Which is, all of that is not good. So. Uh, for me, it's a pass, but there's something there. So Oz, I, I wouldn't be discouraged. I would just dig a little deeper and get more conviction in the story. But for me, I probably would haven't found enough that I'd want to dig a lot deeper personally. Uh, that doesn't mean it won't work. It means it could work. It's just not, I, I have higher and better uses uh, at the moment. Um, but then again, I'm structured differently. So take, take a look. Uh, Jordan Howie, hope you're well. Been listening to the podcast for several years now. Was studying 
Uh, back when I was studying and delivering Domino's pizzas, now to working in finance. Been great to listen to you along the way. From pizzas to a job in finance, uh, listening to the podcast, good for you. Want to ask your thoughts on the CFA chartership. It's not necessary for my current role, but I'd be interested in learning more regarding financial analysis, perhaps use it to leverage into another role in the future. Any insight would be appreciated. Um, also enjoying the new Instagram account, which by the way is at official hedge fund tips, more personalized account. Uh, it's grown like a weed, by the way. Uh, I think when we started uh, putting it in our daily emails, we had like 20 or 30 followers. Now it's up over a thousand, which is pretty cool. Um, so we spoke a couple weeks ago about the JPM conference in London. Yeah, I'm sorry I missed you on that one. Uh, I think there's no downside. You're young, and if you want flexibility and latitude to move, to give you optionality, um, is it a better use of your free time to watch Netflix or to study for the CFA? I'd say CFA all the way. Do it while you're young, uh, before you have kids and family. Uh, get that book. It's not going to make you a great investor, but it's kind of table stakes for you to know the framework uh, from which to become a great investor through experience over time. Uh, and I would highly recommend it, particularly if you want to make a move from where you are at, or, or have the optionality to do so. Why wouldn't you do it? I think it's just an investment of time. It's not much money and it'll be good for you. Jay Apt, uh, wanted to get your thoughts on Meta. I bought it at 180. If you were in Meta from 180, would you see it as long-term play and continue it? What, what do you make? Um, I mean, Meta is a pretty great business. I mean, there's never been an advertising machine created like it in history. I mean, yeah, maybe you take off a third, you know, do what you want to do. This thing over time, five years from now, 10 years from now, it's going to be a lot higher. So if you don't want to pay taxes and you're willing to deal with some short-term volatility, you know, we've gone through this, the Amazons, the Metas, the Googles, they all have 50% drawdowns every few years. So you know, if you can live with this thing being at 275 for six or 12 months, uh, but long term being at a thousand, then don't sell any. Uh, and that's really how you build wealth over time. Uh, if that would drive you crazy and you'd wind up being a seller at 250 because there'd be some headline that the government's suing Mark Zuckerberg and then he has to change the name to, uh, you know, rename the company again to take the heat off of them and he starts calling it. Uh, you know, AI works, uh, you know, or uh, to uh, deflect the, the uh, uh, government uh, inquiry into the impact of Instagram on teens or whatever it happens to be, then uh, then take a third off now. This way, if it goes down, you don't worry about it. You can use that cash to rebuy at a lower rate um, or, or redeploy into something else that's just leaving the station versus has already, you know, uh, had more than a double. But look, all I can tell you is good trade. It's a win-win. Either hold it and deal with the volatility. It's a great business long term. No one can replicate it. Or uh, take a third or a half off and uh, let the rest ride. And then you're less concerned about day-to-day -day volatility. Um, that's opinion, not advice. That's how I would think about it. Uh, thanks for the question. And thanks for uh, all these amazing listeners and comments. Paul Falcone, Tom, hope you're great. Always appreciate listening to you and your thoughts process it's logical and sound looking at zoetis i think you're going to say great company not cheap enough yet curious what you think paul all right paul let's take a look i think i've looked at zoetis a few times in the last couple of months um and i think you're right as to what my answer is going to be All right, so the free cash flow has been basically flatlined for uh, six years. Revenues are growing. Gross margins seem pretty stable. Man, this thing's had a run. Um, let's take a look here. Six point two eight. I mean, 
It doubled revenues, but free cash flow. It's been flattish for years. I mean, it was 1.6 four years ago. Uh, I'd be patient on this. I don't think there's enough. I I don't I don't I don't like I, I don't like the setup. I, I think it's a flattish business that's run a huge amount. You know, the thing was a 20 bagger and now it's pulled back, you know, a third and you want to get involved, but there's no real free cash flow growth for four years and it's trading up. I, I think I understand why you like it. It's a compounder. Uh, probably has a clean balance sheet. I don't even have to look at the balance sheet. I'm guessing it's okay. Let's see. Uh, $2 billion of cash. $6 billion of debt. Eh, a little bit of leverage there. I don't. I just don't see enough upside relative to the risk. I think the train's already left the station. Let's find some things that are, you know, like I said last week, other managers force liquidation is our opportunity. I don't think this has been, there's not been enough pain here, not, not enough blood in the street for me to get excited to take that level of risk. My upside is not enough. I don't see the growth, the clarity of the growth. And I think a lot of the future growth got priced in on this 20X move. So now that they've got flat numbers and it's up 20X, you got to sell me on the story. Where's the next, where's the next bit of growth coming from? And uh, I just can't see it in two minutes. Doesn't mean it's wrong, so you just got to dig a little deeper. I think uh, if this thing gets down to 130 or so, uh, send it in again for, and we'll take a closer look. But uh, even then, they better. I better start to see a reacceleration of uh, free cash flow commensurate with revenues. Otherwise, uh, uh, I'm going to be less interested. So, with that said, I want to thank everyone for tuning in this week. We'll be back next week, same time, same place. In the meantime, make it a great one. Bye for now.